All right, hello, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Apples to Apples, How to Write an Effective RFP for eDiscovery Services. This webinar is free today, thanks to our sponsor, Dialab. First, a couple of housekeeping items. We will have three poll questions throughout this presentation. If you need CLE, please make sure to answer all of these polls. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat section. Questions will then be answered at the end of the presentation in the order they came. As presented today are Babs Deacon and Gina Trimarco. Babs is the Director of Strategic Consulting for EDJ Group. She has more than 25 years in the electronic evidence and litigation support space with a specialization in providing consulting and data reduction services to law firms, corporations, and government clients. Gina is a litigation association associate at DLA Piper. She specializes in labor and employment matters, commercial disputes, and consumer fraud, and she regularly counsels clients about discovery and information management issues, ranging from litigation disputes to project management and proactive policy making. Now, all questions should be held to the end, um, and we will try to get to them in the order that they came. Without further ado, let me hand this over to Bob Deacon. Bob? Thanks a lot, Marilyn. Gina, thank you for joining me. Everyone should know that um, Gina and I have done a few of these kinds of presentations together on vendor selection. And she is going to be, because we're in two different places, she's going to be really great about interrupting me um, so that we make sure that we cover everything that we want to cover. Um, so our agenda today is pretty simple. We are concentrating on the part of vendor selection for specifically for service providers in e-discovery. And we are looking today, our focus is about how to, to write an effective RSP, request for proposal. So our agenda relates to the preparation phase, the actual drafting of the RSP, process management, how do you um, manage the selection process, and then some ideas about vetting responses. And we're hoping um, that we can get through all of, uh, of our uh, content today. Um, so why are we here? We're here because uh, vendor selection is actually very important. And the courts are even looking at um, vendor management um, uh, among litigants. And so this is a little bench slap, um, which is always kind of instructive. So I think that helps the, those of us who are in the business that, that understand that vendor selection is important. It helps us to focus kind of everybody around those issues. Do you think that this is, you think this is an important issue right now, Gina? Of course, and I thank you so much for inviting me to be on this webinar with you because I think this is such an important issue. I've been on both sides of, I've assisted clients with helping to select vendors, um, and I've also been, not, I guess, not so much as a vendor being selected myself, but I have responded to these as well as an outside law firm and in the e-discovery context for projects and it's really, it's the start of your whole relationship. It's the start of how you're going to be handling things, and it's just getting off on the right foot with this and getting good information that can really help you is just key to how your entire uh, case is going to go. And speaking of cases, this particular case, you know, while it might be nice, this was um, a situation where a company had selected a vendor and then completely relied upon them to collect the documents, um, review the documents, and deal with the compliance to a uh, magistrate judge's order with respect to litigation discovery. And the p people had no um, first-hand knowledge of their own. You know, their answer to everything was, well, we hired somebody to do that, and they went and did it, and we don't know what they did. And that did not go over very well with the judge. So just because you've um, found a vendor doesn't mean that you're, you're – burden to comply has been met, and so you need to select carefully and work well with them. Well, you know, I just want to underline a, underline a point that you just made, that the selection process is the beginning of the ultimate relationship with a vendor. I just think that's incredibly important, and I think that um, we need to remember then that selection shouldn't be the beginning of uh, a combative relationship with folks that will ultimately be your partners. So that, you know, uh, 
everybody needs to be treated um, professionally and, and, and with respect during the process. Um, so I'm going to go to the first poll question because we like to know who is um, on the poll. So if you would do us a huge favor and let us know who's participating, and you can see that we are um, asking, uh, you know, if you're a corporate person and you know, maybe you're in the legal department or maybe you're actually a, a procurement person. So um, if you could all respond to that. I'm telling people, it's, people are telling me um, they're getting a little bit of an echo, and I'm hoping that um, it's a little bit better. So the poll questions are up, and Marilyn's going to run that for me. So, so let's talk about the preparation stage. When, and again, we're talking about writing an RFP for vendor selection. So I think it's important to understand in how an RFP is different um, from an RFI. And you know what, Beth? Yeah. Let's step back for a minute because I'm not sure how oh. familiar. Um, let's just, um, you know, because we keep using these acronyms and not really mm -hmm. telling people, you know, request for proposal, request for information, because that kind of helps, I think, with the difference. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. So I guess you're jar we all get to jargon. You're right. An, we do. An, R an RFP is a request for proposal. And an RFI is a request for information. And, um, or it's interesting, I've worked in the government space, and instead of these terms, they sometimes um, ask, uh, use another term, like a statement of qualifications that they look for. Um, so understanding the difference. Now, depending upon how complex your process is, you don't necessarily have to have these completely se separate um, documents or completely separate phases. But if you're if you have a chance to do a kind of thoughtful uh, selection process, you it's really helpful if these are two separate phases. The request for information is usually sent to a larger group of providers. So you're trying to find out who actually provides the services that um, you're looking for. And so because you're asking a little bit more general questions, it allows you to call down so that when you send the RFP out, you're sending it to a more focused group. So the RFI usually asks questions about features or the services that people um, provide. I recommend that it contains a prioritizing of what, which things are important to you at sending out the document. You don't send those, those priorities to the folks who are um, getting the RFI. It's really clear. It's really important to be clear when you're asking what services people provide, your expectations about are they allowed to use uh, partner organizations. I know that, Gina, you, you, know, you think that that's incredibly important at this stage. Yeah. Because I think also is that if you think about it and sort of look at your needs and what type of an organization you are, what kind of data you have, and what I'm getting at is HIPAA and financial services and organizations with regulated information where um, you have deal breaker issues that relate to security or, and what Babs mentioned about partnering with other companies. So say you're using a vendor and they actually subcontract out to other people and security or the location of where your data is held is very important to you, you might as well get those things out of the way and not make it from the RFI to the RFP process with a vendor that has one of those deal breaker issues for you. It's a lot of work to go through the process and you don't want to do it with somebody who you really can't use. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. You know, I think that the RFI one of the, the, the purposes of it is to make your RFP easier because it's going to inform the ultimate way that you ask questions. It makes the um, apples to apples comparison easier because you will understand how people price the services you're interested in. And I think it helps you as an organization understand what features and services are actually really important to you. And um, before we go to the next slide, Marilyn um, said she would read the poll results for us. Marilyn, can you give us some? Can you tell us how people responded? 
Absolutely. Uh, we had corporation legal department. There was 15 percent. Uh, law firm attorneys are at 18 percent. Law firm in discovery litigation support is at 36 percent. Government law department 1 percent and other at 30 percent. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, so just so folks who haven't necessarily done this process this way, this is kind of what a really simple RFI looks like related to services. You're, you list all the services that you that interest you. You ask them to give you a, a, a one for yes, a zero for no. This is an Excel, by the way. I believe this Excel is the secret to all procurement happiness. And you ask them to respond to you about um, how how they price things. Um, and I just think it's it's um, a really helpful phase. Um, so let's talk. Okay, so that was a little bit on the RFI. I don't want to spend too much time because we'll we'll run out of time. Let's get down and dirty in the RFP. First of all, I would like to say that one of the really great things about participating in this process is that you, if, when you come up with a good RFP format for selecting your vendors. It can also be incredibly helpful to use internally um, uh, for your um, uh, your uh, your litigation process when you're when you're um, trying to figure out what a litigation is cost. Um, you're trying to make estimates. Have you had this experience, Gina, internally? I yeah, and really, um, you know, whenever you get a new case, one of the things that it's, you need to do is kind of assess the value of your case. And what that involves is not only your substantive strength, you know, whether you think you will win or lose and by how much, um, but the cost, the cost of defending it or the cost of pursuing it. And discovery nowadays, unfortunately, you know, is one of the largest part of those costs. So it will really sort of help you figure out, you know, whether you should be settling something or going, you know, full speed ahead. And there are a lot of, um, you know, at the beginning of your case, you have, if you're in federal court, and even in state court, really, you should be meeting and conferring. It will make life easier later. Um, so you need to have information to do this. Whether you're the requesting party or the producing party, this is important. Um, and I know it might sound strange for the requesting party, and I'll explain that for a minute. But just kind of moving down the slide about the matter, metrics, gather, and storage, um, uh, those things will, the amounts will translate into your costs. Um, at the beginning of your litigation, you're going to want to be prepared for arguments about, now, if you're the producing party and you think that they're asking for too much, you need to – it's hard to explain why it's too much and actually defend against it if you don't have these concrete costs and information. So if you have priced out – You know what? Yep. Gina, I need to interrupt, but I'm going to now jump to something I know you were going to talk about um, later, the proposed um, changes to federal rules, because I think you're starting to make this point, and then maybe we could go back to that other one, because I think yes. this is a really interesting time for this. And that is very good that you did that for me because I tend to slide right into um, a slightly different topic based on the proposed changes to the federal rules. And first I should point out that there are more changes to the uh, federal rules that are being proposed than the few that we have picked out to show here. And two, my own personal opinion is that all the concepts in these proposed rules already exist in the rules as they stand today. And the point is that to bring these concepts uh, to the forefront and get people to actually use them more. Uh, for example, this proposed change to Rule 34 is borrowing from the existing Rule 33. Um, and it's basically really in the end goal of trying to get people to be more reasonable. For example, the objections on the basis of costly e-discovery will have to be backed up with reliable pricing. I'll tell you that judges are absolutely already doing this. When you come into court and you say, oh, no, it's too expensive, they're going to ask you, well, how? Why? What are you doing? Um, what What is your vendor telling you? What are you paying to load it into a system? What are the hourly rates of people you're using? And if the judge doesn't do it to you, you're a requesting party. And that gets back to how these types of things are useful. As a requesting party, you should know what things cost. Because when somebody comes into court and says, oh, no, it's too much, it's too much, how do you, you know, fight with that unless you have real information? Oh, but he says... You know, you just need information to be able to have these arguments. And that brings us to proportionality, one of my favorite topics. 
proportionality is already existing in Rule 26, and they're moving it up to really try to get people to use it more. To argue proportionality, you need concrete cost information. Now, to picture it, to, an RFP can be a really valuable tool as part of your gathering concrete cost information. It's probably something that you need to do anyway to handle the discovery in the case. And then if you're going to argue that it's too burdensome, I mean, I don't know what would be more defensible than, hey, I went to several different vendors and I tried to figure out how we were going to do this and I engaged in an RFP process. And if you have a lot of similar results, ballpark types of ranges, it's going to add a lot of strength to what you're saying that, you know, no, it's, this is really what it's going to cost to do this. So. Yeah, so it's just, there's just so many benefits to it. I'm going to, I'm going to just scoot back to this really slide a tiny bit. Um, and just underline some of the, the data I put down on here. So first of all, we know related to proportionality especially that you have to do your homework on the early case assessment side too. And we could do hours and hours of webinars on early case assessment. Um, but I think, I want to just underline this little list here, and I know everybody's getting a copy of the slide, so obviously nobody has to memorize this stuff. But from my perspective in working with corporate clients, one of the ways that we use the e-discovery calculator is, well, the, the way it's really enhanced is through your own metrics from your corporate um, experience. You need to have a feeling for, like, what are the average gigabyte counts for your custodians, depending upon how you how you store their email, you archive, understand that as opposed to loose files, uh, whether your folks have actual paper documents. I think it's great to track these um, also metrics related to your culling experiences. And there are some organizations that are really, really aggressive about pre-culling before review. And culling has gotten a bad rap because predictive coding is the flavor of the month. But there are a lot of um, really forward-thinking corporations that are using very serious um, analytics and other methods for culling before they get to review. Again, that's a, a totally uh, larger topic. But So these are the types of metrics that, that are kind of part of the preparation stage that help inform the RFP, and, but then also make this e-discovery calculator really useful. Um, I, uh, have I, uh, let's see, so I'm going to skip back over those things. No, um, and thank you for mentioning that, Babs. I realize I did not get to that as much as I meant, and I think that's a really valuable exercise because when you're shopping for services and vendors, it's really helpful to kind of have an idea of your volume. Yeah, I think the other thing that's nice about it is if you go through the exercise of using the e-discovery calculator, um, you can test the accuracy of your RST before you send it out. Um, because obviously, if you, you know, you want it to all make sense. Um, so let's talk about the actual RFP. Um, so not to, um, beat people over the head with this, but my philosophy is to just be uber controlling. Um, and uh, so I say that you are going to ask your center and RFP that asks for the information in the way that you most that you want to receive it. And if you don't do that, you are going to get a lot of information back that's going to be hard to compare. And when I I talk to people, and I know, Gina, you know, we talked about this too, and yeah. people complain to me about their experiences, they'll say, oh, I got five proposals back, and everybody was pricing stuff differently, and I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Guaranteed to happen unless you really force, you know, decide how you want it and make sure that everybody responds that way. You really can't, you know, gigabyte prices versus um, processing at different stages versus per page versus it, it, you can't. And you don't have time to try to figure it out either. Yeah, it's a, it's a total nightmare. So what I recommend is that, again, we're talking about that preparation stage when you gather metrics from your organization. You want to take those metrics and put together a scenario, even more than one scenario, where to get actually you can ask for different pricing models or you can kind of 
paint a picture of, of maybe one or two different cases um, where you tell the vendors your expected data volumes, how many reviewers or other kinds of users you're going to have, what kind of access you need. Um, you really want to paint a picture of perhaps your organization or perhaps your law firm, and um, you just need, again, you, you want to control the, the, their understanding of your needs. Um, and then this is the other thing I really want to make clear about this. You want to, to, in your RFP, describe things like average number of gigabytes per custodian or average number of emails per gigabyte or your expected call rate. And what I, the, the, whether or not you're going to use search terms, whether or not you're going to use TAR, what I really want everybody to understand about this, and again, this is my philosophy on this, these numbers do not have to be completely accurate for this purpose. Like, if you're saying that for the purposes of the RFP, that the call rate during, you know, the, the pre-processing stages is 50%, the point of that is for you to compare the respondents, not for you to, to limit yourself and, and basically sign on the dotted line that you will absolutely always call at 50%. Um, that, that is not the purpose of those. That's why I'm calling it a straw man. Well, how do you feel about that, Tina? I completely agree. And, um, and I think you shouldn't think about it. Um, think about it as giving you an, something to work with. Um, you can put a range on some of these things. Like say, you know, the call rate, for an example, um, that you think you can always reduce your data by 50% with search terms or, um, you know, say it's anywhere from 40 to 60%. As long as everybody works on the same model or straw man, to use your word, model or example, I guess I would call it, um, you know, you can extrapolate from those numbers and sort of figure out what it will be if it turns out to be more or less. And because everybody's starting at the same starting point, okay, with vendor A, if it's 50%, it will end up costing me X. You know, with vendor B, if it's 50%, it will end up costing me Y. And the point is not whether it – from there, you should be able to figure out what it would be at 60% or 40%. Yeah, I think people are afraid that they'll be committing to some, like, call rate or whatever, and that when it doesn't happen that way, that, that you know, either their process will be useless or their pricing will be useless. Right, and I guess you could really, you know, and as the, of course, I would put in some kind of, um, you know, all estimates or not, <laughs> you know, something to cover that, you know, and if I would worry, you know, just being a lawyer that somebody would come back and say, oh, well, you said it would reduce by this, so therefore it did not, and your price is going to be ten times more. But, you know, you can always put in something to protect against that, and um, it's, uh you know, it should be a price that you can ask about that exact scenario. I mean, that may be something, okay, so what in the event, what happens in the event that we don't meet that reduction rate? What will my cost be? And, you know, maybe I'm getting to it a little too early, but it's always, actually, it's on your very next, you put the slide up, perfect. Um, it's, you should, even if you think you only have, to use the example on your slide, 100 gigabytes of data, it might be good to find out what the price rates would be at a much greater volume because you will find that the greater your volume, you will be offered discounts just like in other types of services. I think that's a similar situation. So, you know, you never know. You may have the exploding data problem and um, you want to know, you know, what would happen if that were to be the case? We always have the exploding data problem. <laughs> so I just and and that's I'm really, really glad you pointed out the range issue in this. So first of all, just everybody look at this screen. This is basically Excel. I send when I do these kinds of RFPs, I send out an Excel spreadsheet. I post all of it, all of the information I possibly can, and I and I explicitly tell the respondents that they must respond in the Excel spreadsheet, they can't make any changes. I'm probably getting ahead of myself in that presentation. Um, and there, 
and they and they can't add rows. They can't, you know, if I tell them they have to respond by gigabyte, they have to, you know, they, or if I say I want to know how much it costs captions, captions per page, then that's how I want to see it. Um, and again, I am not saying on this webinar that this is the way you should ask for pricing, that you should always ask for it by a gigabyte. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, that's, you're going to make that decision based on your research during the RFI phase or just during your research. Um, but I'm saying when you send this out, you send it out in Excel and you make people type into these cells. Um, and also, I think I mentioned it before, but I want to mention it again. You could do two separate tabs in your Excel spreadsheet and use more than one scenario. Like you could have a, okay, I want it by the gigabyte over here, but then on tab two, I want to know your, your, um, given my scenario, your idea about, say, subscription pricing. So, again, we're talking about apples to apples. That's the whole, whole point. I just want to underline, too, um, Gina's point about these ranges. The data is going to explode. And so if you want volume discounts based on the amount of data, this is a great way to ask for it. The other thing about this that I think is incredibly helpful is when we talked before about the e-discovery calculator, if you're using your RFP format to try to figure out what a case is going to cost, when you see the numbers up there that, like, if you go from 100 gigs to, say, 500 gigs, and you see all of a sudden instead of your, your project costing you $100,000, it's costing you $300,000, and you put that in, the, in front of people who are participating in the litigation, you know, don't you think that makes it really so much easier to have that conversation about why all of a sudden the cost of the case was larger? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also gives you, you know, that reminds me to say um, a best and worst case scenario or kind of the way I like to uh, term things sometimes. And um, it gives you almost um, – it, it helps you be less um, – uh, how do I even describe this? But it just it kind of keeps you on point with your budget, you know, knowing how bad, how costly, how where it could go, you know, um, if you don't like say you're trying to reduce the data down and you think ah oh, another hundred thousand documents or so, you know, no problem. I mean these kinds of things will keep you on point. It'll show you kind of on a sliding scale, you know, how far off of the estimates you're getting, what that's going to translate into in price, and it may motivate you to find another way of doing it, um, you know, to go back to your adversary and talk about more terms or figure something out, bring a proportionality argument. But, you know, it, it's it will show you because, you know, when you're in the heat of a project, it's so easy to be working so hard, so hard, and you just kind of creep past, like, without, you know, being on top of kind of project management and prices and using your Excel sh charts and seeing exactly where you're coming out with what your data is turning into, it's very easy to sort of find yourself at the end of your budget only halfway through. Yeah, so I, I think a, yeah. I've definitely seen people use this and say, well, what happens if we collect another 10 custodians? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And my, the reason that I do this with the ranges is you have conversations with people, you show them the numbers, and you say, you know, okay, based on the amount of data you have, it's going to be $100,000. And even if you say to them verbally, orally, what, uh, uh, whatever, um, that if that data goes up, it will be a significant raise, you know, in the rate, they hold, people have a tendency in my experience to hold down to that $100,000 number. So if you show it on the screen, like it could be 100000 or it could be 300000 it could be a million dollars, or it could be, you know, whatever your numbers are, yeah, you're much yeah. more less likely to get booked with you later and say, you told me this case was going to cost $100,000. Absolutely. So, yeah. So let's, let's just um, re make sure we understand all the components of the RSP. You want to make sure you state all the services that, you, um, uh, that you're procuring. And again, um, you want to state your partnership requirements. So if the, the vendors that are, that are responding to your RSP have to basically own all the pieces of the puzzle, so they're, they can't be like, say, partnering people for collection or whatever, um, you need to state that. 
Absolutely, and I'm thinking of, you know, the what's become very important in my life recently, not so recently, you know, maybe over a year, is the HIPAA Business Associate Agreement. And I'm just looking at who our poll, uh, who our audience is, and I bet that a lot of them deal with um, data that contains private information that is problematic if you cause a breach. And you can't, you have to be careful about what vendors you use. And where, you know, once you intake that kind of data, what you do with it. So the partnership requirements are very important and maybe very, you know, depending on whether you're the corporation or the outside firm or, but it may be very important to your business people. See, you had a, when we chatted about this last year, that's a good point to make about, about hosted platform upgrades. When, when, you know, your data is being hosted by the service provider. Well, what's your experience about that? Yeah, that's actually, you'd be surprised, and maybe this isn't everybody's experience, but I have found that, um, so, that you don't own the software, you've just purchased the service, but the software will have upgrades, and you actually, you should make sure that you're entitled to and will be upgraded, you know, and maybe your case might be three years down the road, make sure you're getting all the upgrades that the brand new customer is also getting. Um, they don't necessarily, you know, once your database gets created on a certain review platform, you're not necessarily automatically going to be upgraded at the same time as everyone, you know, a new version comes out. Just make sure yeah, you I consider that, and that's part of your arrangements. I think that's a good, um, a good, you want to walk us through the next um, poll questions here? Sure, sure. So this is poll question number two, and we were curious about preferred e-discovery vendor programs. Who has them um, and kind of how you have them. And it's a funny thing because I thought, uh, so there's yes, of course, yes, but we only have one preferred vendor. And I thought that was kind of funny, juxtaposed against no, but we only have one vendor. So, you know, do you have a program or don't you have a program? But while you're answering the questions to let us know, um, my experience on this has been uh, I love the preferred vendor type of a program. Um, I think preferred vendors, it, it's an excellent arrangement. Um, I think you end up with a lot of really helpful knowledge because you're working with the same people and they get to know you and your business and your data and documents, and it ends up resulting in savings, I think, because you are bringing good business to somebody who is hopefully giving you good discounts in exchange. But the one caution um, that I would put on it, though, is not to forget to stop shopping. And um, because and what I mean shopping is going out and looking for new services. I have seen um, preferred vendor relationships, say, several years down the road. And this industry changes so fast and so frequently, and the prices change. And the pricing arrangement might be kind of old. Um, so, you know, you always have to make sure you stay on top of the latest, latest and the greatest. And when you have developed this relationship, and there should be a lot of value to your preferred vendor relationship, um, you know, it should be somebody you can work with. If you discover, hopefully they keep you, you know, updated on your pricing and your features. But if you discover that, you know, there's something out there that you want for your project, they should be willing to work with you because you've created a good relationship at this point. I, you know, I think the, that um, advice about shopping um, is great advice because, you know, in, as an analyst and as a consultant, I, live, I learn new things every day about how people are using um, software or the kind of pricing arrangements people are getting. And every day it's like, oh, my gosh, I have no idea. Yeah. So I think, it's, I, I think it's really key. Um, I think a good analogy. Oh yeah, uh, I just want to give a good. Uh, think about yeah. your cell phone plan and how they've changed over the years. You know, <laughs> so unless That's you're out there example. looking, I love you'll that. know. Yeah, you won't know. Yeah. Hey, um, um, Marilyn, would you like to read us the poll results? Yes, I will. Uh, we have 27 percent that said yes. We had four percent that said yes, but we have only one preferred vendor. We had 15% who said, no, we purchase on an as-needed basis. 29% said, not officially, but we have several vendors that we use. 0% uh, for a no, but we have only one vendor. 23% uh, said other, and 2% said don't know. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I just think that those different responses just underline how 
you know, it's a confusing issue. It's a complex issue. And, you know, that's one of the reasons we actually like to talk about it. Gina and I like to talk about it. We think it's, you know, we're trying to help help people. <laughs> so let's talk about the managing the process of the RFP. So, first of all, again, that philosophy is it's all about control. And the first thing you want to control is how um, the respondents are getting back to your organization. So, number one, you set up a single point of contact. When you send out your RFP, you say all questions, comments, responses must go to Jim Smith at this email address, you know, and that's what you say. You say you cannot talk to anybody else um, because that just makes it very, very confusing. Um, you said very firm deadlines. Um, and a lot of the reason for this, and I've done procurement for, as I said before, government agencies, and you have to be transparent. So, I, I mean, that was kind of how my, even though I've been in law firms for years, when I did government procurement, that was really how my kind of controlling methodology was formed. Um, and Again, I send out the I send it out in Excel and I tell them that the all the answers have to come back in the same Excel format. But they also have to provide me with a PDF version of of the Excel because I'm looking at that Excel spreadsheet and we're going to get into the, that into detail later. And if heaven forbid I I modify it slightly um, and and modify their pricing, I don't want that to, you know. So I have an also have a PDF that is that is their um, response, you know, in stone, so to speak. So, I mean, do you have any thoughts about um, about uh, this part of process management, Tina? Well, you know, and, and it's funny we spoke about this before. Um, I think you do need to be very, very strict in this part of the process. Absolutely. I mean, as far as some of the things, like for example, the single point of contact, I always worry. You know, I don't see why you couldn't have a pair of people who are both copied on everything. I always worry about creating a bottleneck by, you know, having that kind of a situation. But other than that, I mean, really, you, you do need to be strict because it's it, it is so. It's a process that just wants to bring you back different results. To keep it apples to apples and avoid mixing in some oranges, it requires strict, strict control. That is not exaggerating the degree of control at all. Well, you know, and, okay, so I am controlling, <laughs> but, um, and my, you know, friends and family will, will agree with that. But um, that doesn't mean when you're doing this you have to be a jerk, okay? So first of all, you give people enough time to actually do a good job of responding, number one. Don't send it out, you know, on Wednesday of Thanksgiving weekend and expect to get it back quickly. Um, and here's the other thing that I want to say, um, and I hope that you all aren't getting some weird noise in the background. There's a truck going by. Um, I like to bake in time for questions from the responding vendors, because I think there are times when um, you need to know if there was something in the RFP that was confusing, you didn't describe something well, for example, or maybe one of your formulas doesn't work. Um, and so there is nothing wrong with, even though you're being controlling and firm, there's nothing wrong with leaving in, um, having your first deadline for being, for, um, uh, receiving questions. And this is then how I handle the questions and the answers. I get all of the questions by the deadline, and then I send them all out with the, the answers as one document to the resp all of the respondents. And this is part of the transparency. And if I've modified the RFP, and it's possible that I've had to do that because I, maybe I've gotten some good feedback from the respondents, you don't have to be egotistical about it. You don't have to be, no, my RFP was perfect. Um, but I send it then all back out to everybody. And this is, um, again, this really underlines the transparency and the fairness of the, of the process. And, Babs, you know, to just add on your point about, um, you know, how controlling doesn't mean uh, equal being a jerk. I mean, this is the start of a relationship. And I see the control more, I guess, as being very defining what you want very clearly and in a very detailed fashion. 
and maybe even, you know, one part of setting up an RFP for these kinds of services is I think you should involve. If you have a procurement department, fantastic, but you really also need to make sure that um, you have technology people involved as well as your lawyers, you know, kind of stakeholders of everybody who's going to need to use this because sometimes – um, I think a lot of times RFPs go wrong because questions are asked that cannot be answered or they just don't fit the situation or you're just not explaining exactly what you need the best way possible. So you get these answers and you're like, huh? But it was really the question that was the problem in the first place. So, you know, don't be, I would vet them before everybody you can in your organization and get different perspectives on whether your RFP is as well thought out as you think it is. You know, I just got a I just got a question that somebody popped in with. It's a really good question, and I'd love to. An, I'm going to answer it right now. Somebody asked me, "How do you approach the issues that vendors may be reluctant to have their responses shared with other vendors?" And I think that there's some misunderstanding here, and I apologize for not making this clear. We I never share um, a vendor's response to the proposal with other vendors. That's completely unethical. And, you know, it happens a lot. But I do share the question. So if uh, if a um, – and I say this in the RFP. So if I say, okay, November 12th is the deadline for any questions, and any questions that you ask will be shared with everyone and the answers will be shared, Okay. So there's a little bit of a difference there, but I never then share the actual proposal from one vendor to the next. And I do hear about this out there in the world and people do that, and that's not kosher. Um, uh, I hate to be too technical there. So I hope that that answers that question. I just really wanted to get that out there. So, yeah, if, I'm only, if somebody asks me a question like, uh, do you really want the caption pricing per page? I'm going to answer that question to everybody and say, yes, I really want the cash and pricing for me. So I hope that made that clear, and I really appreciate um, that quick question. Um, let's talk about evaluating the responses. Um, first of all, again, you're going to be trans transparent and equal. So the first thing I do is if somebody misses the deadline, um, they're dropped. You just and, – and, Gina, you made a good point about this. Yeah, it was, you know, if at the beginning of the relationship – Things are going wrong, and they can't do exactly what you want. Um, well, then, you know, that's kind of a sign of things to come. And it sort of reminded me of first dates. Like, if your first date is bad, you know, that's when everybody's supposed to be on their best behavior and showing their best side. It's not a good sign if there's already a problem at that point. Right. If they can't, if they can't meet your um, RFP deadline. Um, yeah. Yeah. Indicator of things to come on your project, I would say. Yeah. Um, unless there was some weirdness. I mean, you know, you have, again, you have to be like a, an adult about it. The other thing that I do, I'm going to show this in a second, is I compare all the responses in Excel, and I don't, I try to do it without actually ever modifying everybody's Excel spreadsheet. And I'm going to show that in a second. And again, I, I get a PDF version. The other thing that happens is, of course, you do reference checks. People will say, okay, these are the five organizations we worked with who love us. I use my networking skills to find clients of the service provider that are not on the reference um, list. And I ask them the same questions that I ask the reference. And I've had... Um, uh, really good results with this. I have to say this more specifically in the software category um, where I've been able to track down people that are using the software and say, okay, how did you like it? And, you know, what were the issues? I, I found that incredibly helpful. That's um, the most valuable thing I found. No reference who's ever been given to me as a reference ever told me anything other than, oh, yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, people – are smart about who they use as their references. They don't put down people where there's been problems or issues or, you know. So that's a really great idea. It sometimes can be hard to find, but <clears throat> it's just another reason we all have to develop our networks anyway. So There you go. Link, LinkedIn, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to show everyone, and I know this is probably hard to see on the screen, what I mean when I say I compare the answers without 
modifying. And I'm sure there are a lot of people on this call who are much better at Excel than I am. So this is really bad, like, you know, dummies Excel. Um, so I, I, I start with, like, a, a fresh um, spreadsheet or in uh, uh, separate from the responses. And then I just use formulae to reference the external file, each of the um, respondents' files, and those particular um, cells that I need. So I know it's hard to see this, but you can see, for example, it says in my first column, vendor number one. I'm referencing from, like, what would be my C drive, very old-fashioned here, um, rfp1.xl, and then the tab name, and then the cell name, okay? And when, if I do this, and then you can see under vendor number two, I'm referencing RSP2 Excel, okay? And I'm referencing the same tab name, um, but a different, in this down here, I'm referencing, happening, referencing a different cell. And so I can see everybody's responses without even, quote, unquote, opening the files that they sent me. Now, I'll open the files and make sure they've named everything correctly, of course, even though I told them how to do this. Um, but, okay, so, you know, I know this is just basic Excel, but this makes me really happy because then I know I'm not editing anything. Yeah, now I think you're selling yourself short on the basic Excel. So my lawyer translation of this is that first you can get somebody else to do this for you. Chances are somebody in your firm and your organization will know how to use these formulas. And basically it's <laughs> – you're downgrading how easy it is. Um, okay. Easy to use. Find the nerd. Okay, A, first of all, step one, find the nerd. <laughs> right, right. No, but it's a really valuable exercise because basically it's using the Excel formula to take the information from all your different RFPs you've received and kind of bring it up into one fresh sheet and put it side by side. So you're not literally old school printing, you know, six different Excels and trying to arrange them on your desk so that the price for gigabytes and dollars lines up next to each other, it's a valuable thing. And then if you need to report up to somebody, like most of us probably do, um, you can then go from there and kind of snapshot it into a really good comparison view. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but that's the name of the game. And, yeah. you know, I just have a horror, as being an old database person, I have a horror of doing any unnecessary data entry. So, hey, the other thing I do when I crunch the numbers is when I do vendor ch um, reference checks, or non-reference checks, I'm going to ask. It's like a survey. I, I do it on the phone, but I ask them to respond, um, you know, on a scale of one to five, you know, quality of project management, for example. On a, on a, on a uh, scale of one to five, how do you like these people? And then I get, and I also get comments, okay? So you're basically trying to, like, commoditize in a, in a certain respect the entire process. Um, let's take another poll question. Um, so, so I'm just interested. We're interested. Everybody on the on the phone. How would you, if you have your druggers, as my mother would say, how do you actually want to buy e-discovery services? By gig collected, by custodian, by document, by gigabyte, like in in review, okay? By subscription or other. Um, and, uh, oh, we, see, this is a good slide. You know, tell, now, since we're talking about these issues of evaluating vendors, what's your philosophy on that? Well, there it is right on the top. It's not all about the price. Of course, the price is incredibly significant and often ends up being the differentiator in the end. But um, number one, uh, one of the most important things to my clients lately is security. So the thing about allowing partners and where the data is being held and what – security exists around it is can be very much a deal breaker. And then I have another sort of by way of example. I have one really long-running case um, to the point of I have data hosted in a couple different places over the course of about seven years. So I call it the tale of two vendors. And they're both excellent, and I am so not naming names. But um, on one of them, I've had the same project manager who seems to be like a serious career project manager. Um, for the entire time period, from the beginning of my project to the end. And on the other side, I've had maybe a different project, ma project manager every year. And while nothing against the quality of the new project manager every year, the problem is that 
um, they weren't there for the part of my case when it was really heavy lifting as far as what we were doing in the software with documents. So they just don't have the history, and they don't have my case knowledge, and it's kind of really difficult because I don't have any help, not any help, but I have a lot less help on that side, whereas on the side where I have the person with the seven, eight years, um, you know, I can ask them anything, and it's just really helpful. So there's a lot of differentiating factors besides just the literal price. Um, yeah, and people are going to be now emailing you at the end of this thing and asking for your project manager, I can tell. Mm. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, so, and I want to underline this, too, that, I mean, when you ask questions in the RFP, it's not just that Excel. It's not just those numbers. You're also going to ask people to, um, you know, give you their philosophy of, of project management. Tell, you know, tell you about their workflow method. Tell, give you, go ahead and ask them, um, what do you think is the, and you can also ask these in the RFI, you know, if you think that this would be um, helpful at that stage. What do you think is their their best way to price stuff or their best way to call data? Um, you know, don't just ask um, ISO certifications. You know, ask them their philosophy about data security, about disaster recovery, stuff like that. I think and this is actually a suggestion I got from a conversation I had with a service provider guy who's been in the business a very long time. He said, you know, if people just sometimes read the text that we sent, they really have a clear feeling for the difference between us and the other guys. So I just think that's important to – I don't want people to think that it's for – that this method that I'm, that I'm putting up here on the screen is um, only about numbers. So um, – Marilyn, do you want to read the um, results for us, please, of the poll? Yes. Um, the first, first it was by data by collected, 40%. By custodian is 9%. By document is 6%. By gigabyte document reviewed by human is 17%. Via, via annual subscription is 15%, and then other was 13%. Okay. All right, so people are still using the gigabyte method and, and this is understandable because it's very, it's, it is an, an apples to apples um, method. Um, so this is our last slide before questions. And you know, we don't have any, um, any questions right now. And we're kind of, I think we have time for one. If anybody has a question, they want to ping in if uh, people don't have, um, you know, bads and, and Gina fatigue. Um, so I think you brought this up um, a little bit earlier, uh, Gina, about making sure, mm -hmm. like, that your, your pricing is, is up to date. What about negotiating? Oh, absolutely. You're going to find out new things about uh, pricing, and you are going to also um, run into situations. Um, I had a situation several years ago, but it was just I ran into a volume that I'd never had before, Just and it, it, it didn't work in any traditional pricing model. It literally came out to be millions, and there was no way on earth. Um, so it just, and we ended up coming into some creative solutions that were offered by the vendors themselves. We went into an RFP process, and on that particular point, it was sort of like, well, this is our problem. What do you think? <laughs> you know, we were almost asking for some proposed solutions, and um, it ended up being a really good exercise. A lot of creative thoughts came out of it. And it sort of helped us find a new way of dealing with things. So absolutely negotiate. I think you have to negotiate, and you will constantly come up with new things happen all the time. Um, maybe you'll end up with, a, hopefully this won't happen to you, but, you know, a cache of voicemails or something, or, you know, something new that you have to deal with. So you're always going to find yourself, the minute you think you're all set, You'll either come up with some new volume, some new format, uh, something else, a case that requires something a little different. And um, it should be, the relationship should be one that grows and is not completely static. You know, you've picked somebody and now this is it. It's your set price and that's how it shall remain. There should always be room for negotiation. I, I, I think a lot of people do that. I think a lot of people um, keep up to date on pricing info, and they like their vendor, vendor but they might need need a pricing refresh. 
Um, and I think that's okay as long as you're not beating somebody down. We actually have like 60 seconds, and we have some some quick questions. And I'm sorry I didn't see these before. I wouldn't have said that I didn't have any questions. So um, the um, answers, people are asking about, first of all, how long does this kind of thing take, these different stages? And, you know, you need some, first of all, you need to give time for people to respond to an RFI, um, and then you need to give yourself time to um, look at the RFI responses so that you um, uh, can, can so, so it can inform your RFP. So it can take a few weeks um, to maybe a month between those phases. But it, and, you know, you want to give people time, too, even in the RFP phase when you're asking um, uh, people for questions. You know, you want to, again, the, if you get really good questions back from your vendor, vendors, I think that that's a, um, I think that's really, really helpful. So I can't give you a hard and fast thing, but you have to look at, at how much is on the, the, the plate of the teams that are actually putting these documents together and then, and then evaluating. Well, that's now a good that's point. Yeah. you have time, right? So, you know, like if you're right. a risk, right. you know, thing. I'm sure you had those experiences. Exactly, exactly. So I know I'm wondering if there's a um, minimum time frame that you would recommend not going below, but I'm almost thinking, well, okay, if I knew I had, if it was some smaller amount of data and it was kind of finite and it was for one specific project or case, you know, I mean, how – I would think that – that you could get that price faster and do that RFP in a shorter time frame than if it's something that involves, say, like collection and review software and, you know, if it's well, depending on how broad the service Let me just interrupt and say, in my mind, this is the reason that you have a preferred vendor selection program. You get your vendors ready. You know the people you like. You've already made sure that they understand your data needs, et cetera. And then when the next case hits, you're good to go, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is the, the biggest reason for having a vendor selection program. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, it definitely is, um, you know, in a general sense, it's kind of a long process, right, as you yeah. said. Okay. So somebody asked, where do you get, where do you identify new vendors? And there are a lot of places out there. Somebody said, Apercy, yes. E-Discovery Journal, we have a database. Uh, it's called The Matrix. Um, you need to talk to your colleagues. You should talk to your um, your corporate clients, talk to other law firms, uh, go to legal tech, read blogs. Um, yeah, what am I join E-Discovery e groups so that you, um, oh. I mean, from there are all sorts, from the LinkedIn groups to, um, if you're a woman, there's women in e-discovery chapters to, I mean, there's all kinds of seminars and things, and you'll kind of get to know other people who are like-minded, interested, and that's always a great source, is other people who actually use these products. Right. Okay, I've had another question, and this is the last one because we're, we've run out of um, time, and I just wanted to underline this. This question is about asking for doing the desired pricing model after you've analyzed the matters you have had actually experienced so that you can provide those metrics. Absolutely. The trouble is with providing and that's what I mean by a scenario. If you can get information, if you're a corporation and you can look at the you know, and you're a serial litigant, um and you can look at your experiences with average sizes of mailbox or custodians, average amount of debut, average amount of culling, average, you know, if you're having experience with predictive coding. That's what you want to use. But I have to say honestly, um, and I'm hoping this changes um, as, the, as we're all evolving, getting those metrics is incredibly hard. Um, I talk to vendors who say they encourage people who are asking for pricing information to figure out what those kinds of averages are or what their experiences are. I talk, and they say it's very difficult, which is why it's hard for a lot of people to buy e-discovery services in a subscription model. Because to have the subscription model, you have to be able to say, well, this is what my litigation spend looks like. 
So in, in law firms, it's incredibly hard if, and I know you have this experience, kinds of experience, Tina, you know, where you have a client, all of a sudden they've been hit with a suit, and, you know, you don't have any control necessarily of, like, what kind of metrics you can ultimately get out of them, right? Absolutely, and, you know, what is valuable, I've also had the experience of being a national coordinating council for discovery, and, you know, it's it's definitely worth the effort because, like, with anything else, when you're buying in volume, you can negotiate so much better for so much more. So if you can kind of get a handle on what volume you have and then use it as an advantage in your negotiations, I mean, it's just invaluable. Return on yes, investment, for sure, when that one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we have answered the majority of the questions. Um, Gina, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I think we need to go on the road because you're like the real easiest person to do a webinar with. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Marilyn. And thank you, Zylab, for being our sponsor. We really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to, um, you know, talk about these issues. And thank you, Marilyn.